Well, good morning, Refinery family. So good to be back with you again this week. Opportunity to be here two Sundays in a row. As you know, our lead pastor is on uh, sabbatical right now. I got a nice text from him this week from Missouri. Uh, he had a dinner with a good friend of mine, passed on some good, some good words. And so they're, they're doing fine on their, their trip and preaching and resting and renewal and connecting with a lot of people, uh, though we miss having them here. Well, today we're going to continue our discussion of real bad habits. And what we're going to talk about is excuses. Excuses, excuses, excuses. Most of us are pretty good at them. We're pretty good about having excuses to and from ourselves. Often we have good excuses with people when we don't really want to do something. We kind of manipulate the circumstances so that we can kind of get out of that which we want to get out of. But often we also give our excuses to God that we know and we sense and feel a nudge that he's trying to get us to do something. And we don't necessarily audibly say something, but by our decisions, by our actions, we give an excuse to him why we cannot do it. Well, today we're going to look at somebody who made those excuses. And the interesting part to me is he had a verbal conversation with God. This was a time when God was audibly speaking. And he is talking to God, and he is coming back with objections and excuses to God face-to-face, if you will, at least voice-to-voice. And so it's kind of bold. It's actually kind of stupid. But he did it. And that person is Moses. Moses, a little bit of backstory, was a Jewish person, a Hebrew, actually. And they, the Hebrew people were slaves in Egypt. And the Pharaoh had made a decree that any baby boys born to the Hebrew families had to be thrown into the Nile River to drown. Well, this young woman had a baby, and she didn't want to throw her baby son into the Nile River, and so she kept him quiet for for three months. Then she took some straw and made a basket, put some tar around it so it could float, and she put the baby in the basket, placed it out in the Nile River, hoping that he would be preserved in some way. To see what was going on, she had a daughter, a young girl, that she asked her to watch the baby as it went down the Nile River. And lo and behold, what happens is that the daughter of Pharaoh is is bathing. And she sees this basket, and her heart is touched. Now, this is going to cause a little bit of a family problem. You see, her father had just said that all baby boys that come from the Hebrews are to be drowned, and now she has compassion on this child and wants to raise him up as her own. Well, the sister comes up to her and says, would you want me to get one of the Hebrew women to come and nurse this baby for you? And she said, yes, I would like that. And so, of course, she goes back and gets her mother, who is the mother of this child, And she then is able to nurse and take care of him for a period of time. His name, as you know, is Moses. Moses was a name given to him by Pharaoh's daughter. And Moses means to draw out because she said, I drew him out of the water and took care of him. Well, he is raised in the the ways of Egypt. Educationally, understanding the military aspect of it, the government aspect of it, and he is a very high-ranking person within that, even though he is a Hebrew person. And he is given a responsibility at one time to oversee the work of the Hebrew slaves. So here he is as a Hebrew, as a daughter of the son of Pharaoh, and now he's supervising the workers. And he observes that an Egyptian man is beating up a Hebrew worker. And he looks around And as he does, he doesn't see anybody there. And so Moses kills that man. And to dispose of him, he digs a hole in the sand and covers him with sand and leaves and goes his way. The next day, he sees two Hebrew people fighting with each other. And he said, why are you fighting with your fellow Hebrew? And one of the men objects and he said, who makes you judge over me? Are you going to kill me like you did that Egyptian? And when that man said that, it scared Moses to death because he didn't think anybody saw what he had done. 
and he knew that the word must be out. In fact, he got all the way to Pharaoh, his adopted grandfather, and, his grand and Pharaoh wants to kill him. And so he has to get out of town. He gets out as fast as he can, goes out in the desert, goes to an area called Midian. When he gets out in that area, he's going to go to a well, and there are seven young girls with uh, their flock. But there are also some other herdsmen who come and push their flock out of the way so they can water his. And Moses gets ticked off at this. And so he has a little altercation with these men and gets them out of the way and then takes care of the, the girls' flocks himself. Well, they go home and they tell their father, Jethro, about this. And Jethro said, well, why didn't you invite him to come to dinner? Go out and find him and bring him here. And so they do that. He comes and has dinner with them. And in fact, Jethro invites him to stay with him. In fact, his oldest daughter, Zephyrah, becomes Moses' wife. So now he has left his life of Egypt, of being a high-ranking person, of being the grand, adopted grandson of Pharaoh, and now he's a shepherd. He takes care of sheep and goats. He got out of the busy city, and now he's in the country, kind of enjoying his change of pace. He takes his flock out in the desert and goes to a, a mountain called Mount Horeb. And when he goes there, he sees a very unusual sight. He sees a bush that's on fire, but the bush isn't burning. And it catches his attention, and, and fire has a way of doing it. You can have different reactions to fire. A couple of weeks ago, we, in our little fire pit, we were, made s'mores and sat there and ate them, and then just kind of watching the fire, it's relaxing. But sometimes fire is not relaxing. It's, it's horrifying. It's, it's terrible. Several years ago, in, when we lived in Corona, California, the, the neighborhood started on fire. There was a, a car went down the freeway. It uh, caused a spark and it caught the, the grass by the side of the freeway and it just spread and it came in, in our neighborhood. Well, I didn't want to leave my house until I walked outside and I saw my neighbor's tree on fire. And I said, that's not a good thing when the tree is just burning up. And it, it was burning up. It wasn't like the bush. In fact, 17 houses in our neighborhood were, were damaged, and one was completely uh, destroyed. And so it was a frightful thing. We, we left our home before we went to another place because we couldn't go back for a day or two. And it was watching the fire, wondering if our house was going to burn down or not. And then we saw the fire spread. It went right over this hill towards your Belinda. And I swear, it took only about a minute. That fire just, when it got started, just went whoosh right over the hill to the next city. It was just so fast. It was terrifying at that point in time. Thankfully, our house didn't get damaged other than smoke. It was pretty smoky for quite a while. And here's an unusual thing. It catches Moses' attention, and he sees that it's burning, but it's not burning up. And so he walks over a little closer, and then the bush speaks to him. Moses, Moses. Now, you, you got to think he's wondering what's going on here. I mean, a bush that's not burning, a bush that speaks. You know, maybe he's been out in the sun a little bit too long, you know, and is kind of dehydrated, having a little emotional breakdown in the midst of all the things that have happened in his life. But he's still curious, and as he's getting closer, the bush continues to speak to him and said, Stop. Don't come any closer. Take your shoes off, for this is holy ground. Well, not really shoes. He took off his sandals. I'll take off my shoes. One thing I have that Moses didn't have is I have Christian socks. <laughs> They're a little holy. And so I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my shoes back on. No, no offense to God, if you will. It's still holy ground, but uh, I think he can handle my shoes. But you may not handle me not having them on. I did take a shower, but, you know, your, your feet sweat anyway. At least mine do. Okay, so he, he's standing there with holy ground. And um, God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when Moses hears that, he, he hides his face. Because now he's talking to God, which seems pretty crazy, in a bush. But he doesn't want to look at God because it is holy ground and it's God he's speaking to. And God says, I, I want you to go back to Egypt. I've heard the cries of my people, how oppressed and suppressed that they are. And I want you to go and see Pharaoh. 
Moses said, wait, 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 wait. Who am I to go back and talk to Pharaoh? Uh, you know, I, I've, I've escaped from here. I, I murdered somebody. I, my grandfather wants to kill me. There are other people who want me dead. I don't know that I want to go back there. Who am I to be able to do any of this? And God said, I want you to go back and to talk to the people, tell them and let them know that, I've, that I'm with you and I care about you and I care about what has happened in your life. Go and talk to the elders, the elders, and tell them that I've heard about their oppression. I want them to then go with you and they'll listen to you. They're going to listen to you. Don't worry. Then I want you to go to Pharaoh with them and to tell them to let my people go. And Moses' head's kind of spinning at this point. What, what, what am I going to do? And he's, he's taking objection. He says, now, now, God, now think about this. I go back to Egypt and say that you've talked to me. And I talked to you in a, in a burning bush. And you've told me to go back and tell Pharaoh to let, let them go. How are they going to respond to that? Are they going to think, yeah, right, God spoke to you, you know, you probably need a little psychological training, you know, help right now. Let's get you tested out to see what's wrong with you. Uh, how do we know that God spoke to you? You're probably coming just to, to trick us and to get us in trouble. And so God says, well, what do you have in your hand? He said, I have a staff. Not exactly a staff. It's, it's a cane. It was actually my mother's cane. Uh, and uh, he said, take that cane or that staff, <laughs> and throw it down on the ground. And when he does, it becomes a snake. And, and Pharaoh, I mean, excuse me, Moses runs away from that snake because, I don't know, he's kind of like me. I don't like snakes. You know, do you? I mean, some of you do. Some people like to play with snakes. I don't like them. Uh, the, the, the poisonous ones in particular or the big ones. I, I was up speaking in Oregon a few years ago, and the missionary that was there was from uh, Thailand, and he showed this picture of this humongous Snake. I mean, it was like 50 feet long, and it was about this big. And so I actually got on the Internet to see if I, what picture I would show you and looking up giant snakes in the world. I decided not to show any of those to you. <laughs> I mean, they are scary. You might want to go home and do it and take a look, but I think after a while you say, oh, so here's this big snake, and, you know, the head is about like that. But the belly is like this because it's swallowed some animal whole, you know, so it's got the whole animal in it. I mean, it's, it's just nasty, all right? So I could see why Moses ran away. But then he said, pick it up by the tail, and when he does, it turns into a staff again. I thought, you know, that could be really useful going to Disneyland. <laughs> You're in a long line. You throw that puppy down. The snake is there. People start gathering. You pick it up, you walk to the front of the line, right? I think that could work. Or go to a Diamondback game. You ever have to wait for a hot dog? There's no waiting for hot dogs now. You just put it down and people scatter and then you pick it up. You know, it's no problem. What's wrong? I don't know why these people are leaving, you know? So there could be some use of that. And then he said, well, try this. Put your hand into your cloak and pull it out. And when he pulls it out, it's white. It's leprous. He's got leprosy. And then God said, well, put it back in your cloak <laughs> and pull it out. <laughs> and and it's, it's whole again. I mean, that could work at the Disneyland as well. They say, oh, unclean, unclean, here's a leper, right? And so people scatter away. And he said, and if neither of those work, then I want you to go to the Nile River get some water, pour it out on the ground, and it'll turn into blood. I mean, God's got an imagination here, right? I mean, this is weird stuff, but he's trying to say, I'm going to prove to them that you spoke to me and that I've sent you. But then Moses said, time out here, just, just, just a second, God. I'm not very good at speaking. I have a slow tongue and a slow speech, even while I'm talking to you. Now, I identify with that. 
I identify with it because as a, a grade school kid, I went to speech therapy. I had trouble getting my words out right. I had trouble particularly with my S's. I still don't say an S right. Some of you can just say that S and it's nice and crisp. I could never do that, still can't do that. And uh, it took a while to work through that. I, I stuttered, not terribly, but I stuttered. And I still do when I get tired or I get a little nervous or if I just talk too fast, which I can have a tendency to do. And so it's something to have to deal with. And it seems it's kind of funny how you go full cycle as you go on in your life. Now as an, an old guy, I, I had two teeth extracted this, this spring and uh, I uh, had to get a partial. So I'm trying to learn how this partial works. And they said, you're going to lisp. I said, well, that's great. <laughs> I mean, I, what I, I talk, right? I talk. And so I have it in. And maybe you can hear a little lisp or a little something. There, It's my, it's my uh, partial. And, but I've tried to do it without it also, and I still have a lisp because of where the, my teeth came out. And my wife said, you're, you're lisping. So whether I have, an, have them in or have them out, I, I have a little trouble saying the things that I want to say as clearly as I want to say them anymore. So I've gone full cycle. But my point is this. Moses said he couldn't speak. I've had trouble speaking, and yet God does what God does. He, he, he makes up for that, and he overcomes those excuses and those fears and those shortcomings and does his work regardless of the impurity, the inconsistency, the imperfections of the human beings that he's using. So he said, I'll help you speak. Don't worry about it. Then God, Moses raises his hand again. God, I've got one more question here, one more problem. Can't you send somebody else? <laughs> I mean, I don't want to go back there. You know, look, look, people want to kill me. I can't talk very well. I know you said you'd be with me, but these people are going to be skeptical. They're going to complain and complain and complain that I talk to. And now the burning bush is really burning. I mean, not that it's burning up, but it's getting bright. And the reason it gets bright, because the text says that God's anger was burning against Moses. He's up to here with him with his objections and his excuses, because he's given him some answers. It's not enough. And now he's really ticked off. And he says, all right, you've got a brother, Aaron. He's a good speaker. You and Aaron go, have Aaron do the main part of the speaking, when he speaks, it will be as if you are speaking, and whatever you tell Aaron to say, it will be as if God is speaking to him. And so God, I'm going to speak through you, through Aaron, to the people. And so Moses goes back to Jethro, and he said, I'm going to go back to Egypt. Is it okay with you? And Jethro says, sure, go back. See if any of the people that you know, any of your family is still alive. And so he gets his wife to the Pora and his sons, and they have, go back to Egypt, and he tells Pharaoh to let my people go. The objections, the excuses not to do what God wanted him to do. We had a mission team go to Puerto Rico, and as they went, as they were there, they were asked about the excuses that they possibly were going to give for not going on the mission trip. And I want to share that with you. So, did I have any excuses for not going on this trip? Absolutely, let me get you my list. So, one of my excuses would be just, um, it, it's out of my safe place. I'm not in control. I don't love to travel. Don't like airplanes that much. And still it's worth it. Uh, an excuse I had was I didn't know what to wear. I didn't have any clothes, but yeah. The biggest excuse that I've always used for missions or is always worked. I've always got to work. What I learned, you know, on my first trip is that work will wait. Everybody's got an excuse, but uh, ours was we were too busy at home, um, just not time for this. Um, you can bet we'll, we'll be making time for, for it from now on because it, it really is something that you'll never do any, any time unless you just put your one foot in front of the other. Just take the step. Just do it. 
Uh, the excuses that I had coming has been health issues. You know, God's got me here for a reason. And um, if it's to carry things or if it's just to meet people and to, to spread the word, but uh, it's just an exciting experience and um, I'm getting chills. <laughs> it's just, you can feel the spirit everywhere. It's just crazy. Yeah, um, to be totally transparent, uh, money. <laughs> uh, I've, I've really struggled with always finding a practical excuse not to spend money on anything ministry related. And, and, and in some ways, to be truthful, I've, I've been selfish with my resources when God is the reason that I have been entrusted with those anyways. And I've been, you know, not a good manager of, of what God has given me. So that, that has been the number one excuse so in trying to get here, this is not my comfort zone. Um, I thought of everything. Um, there were starting to be issues at work. The boss telling me, you know, it's not convenient to take for you to have this day off. And I could have easily, and I thought about it a few times, like just saying, oh man, refinery I'm you know I know I put that deposit down I, I know I felt that call at that moment and I signed up but my work needs me I had luckily a husband that was like no we can't back out of this and I'm like okay I'm gonna go and it, it went down to the last week it's like man I mean I can say I, I, I don't I don't have to go I can do that and then, nope, no. God's like, nope, got to go. I, I'm not going to give you the answers you want until you go. And um, so just just go. There, those things will still be there when you get home. Just go. You won't regret it. So it doesn't matter whether it's it's money. You'll find the money because, because Jesus takes care of you. If it's time, you'll find the time because work should be second in your life. I, it's, it's easy to chase the dollar. You don't need to leave your laptop at home, keep your cell phone on silent in your pocket and just serve. And, and you will find this to be the greatest experience. There isn't really a, a, an excuse that you cannot find in your heart to overcome. So what I'd like for you to consider today and this coming week is be aware of your excuses. Excuses to yourself. Maybe it's a rationalization. Maybe it's getting yourself off the hook in some way. But maybe it it's becomes time that you just own up to whatever the situation is. Think about the excuses you give to other people. Rather than give an excuse, just give an honest answer. Just be more straightforward. I know that's hard. It's not easy. But perhaps that's you ought to do. And then in reference to God, I don't know what it is. It's not necessarily a mission trip, so we're not just saying everybody ought to do that. But there's a way, there's something that God is kind of touching your heart today. It might be to be in a better relationship with Him. It might be to be more regular in worship. It might be to serve other people. I, I, I don't know, but you know, you know that God is tugging at your heart and he wants you to do something that you've been hesitant to do. And so I encourage you not to give an excuse to God, whether that's oral or if it's just through your actions and your attitudes, but rather you'd say, okay, God, you've promised that you'll be with me, you'll help me. And like Moses, he did something beyond his capability because he finally submitted to God. You can do things beyond your capability because God working through you makes it limitless. Excuses, excuses, excuses. What are we going to do with them in the coming week? Let's pray. Father, I thank you uh, that Moses finally succumbed and listened to you. And uh, I know that uh, each of us are here today having some things that we're making excuses to ourselves and to others and even to you. And I pray that you'd help us with us because it's not easy. It's so much easier to do excuses, but help us to also um, submit ourselves to you and find the, the joy, the power, the love, uh, the experience that you have for us as you are working with us and within us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.